Okay, I'm Patricia Grubel from Los Alamos National Laboratory. And uh, like Dave said, I'm gonna talk about Git workflows and how you can use them for collaboration with your team. And first we're gonna talk a little bit about version control with Git and then I'll go on to the main mechanisms for collaboration, which include branches, pull requests and forks. Uh, then uh, we'll talk about some different types of workflows and uh, the different types of complexity that you can use in your Git workflows to um, facilitate the collaboration. And we'll show some examples of some current CSE projects and how they are using Git workflows successfully to collaborate. And finally, what I want you to do is think about what you want to use for your type, what type of complexity will work for you, um, what the goals are for your project, or even in your uh, personal work, whether you're a student and you're um, trying to uh, collaborate with other students and your advisor. Um, also, if you're on a small team or a large team, you can think about these different types of workflows and what's important for you. So the goal, uh, are that development teams would like to use version control to collaborate productively while still making sure that their code is correct. And we'll show you some ways that you can do this with the, the Git workflows. So first we'll have a, a, a brief explanation. Did I go backwards? <laughs> I did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the first workflow is a very basic workflow. Um, the process uh, is, is a way of collaborating by having a remote, remote repo where uh, each developer can have their own local copy and work on that there and yet share their work uh, with this remote repo um, to other collaborators. There are some problems with this uh, very basic type of workflow. Um, because there everybody is working directly on master. And then, so you have to think about what if you have a lot of team members? Uh, what if you have one team member that likes to do a lot of work and doesn't push it into the remote until a long time has gone by and then the divergence from what is in there is, is very great. Um, so um, there are other uh, ways to make this better for your team. And these mechanisms are the things that will help do that. There are branches that enables people to work on uh, separate issues and features in the same repo, but in a different space. Uh, so they can have, um, uh, you can have distributed work and parallel work. It also gives you a way to fix your particular workflow um, in a, the type that works for your project. The second mechanism are pull requests. This enables code review and testing before a merge goes into a main branch. And then there are forks. Uh, forks give outside contributors that don't have right access to your repo a way to um, get a copy of the repo and work on it and then maybe suggest changes in the original repo through that mechanism. And uh, this also maintains the control for the original repo with the uh, team that manages it. So first we'll talk about branches. Um, this gives you a means of doing independent work. Um, and it, while you're protecting your master branch, you're working in a different branch, as you can see in this feature A here. Um, it organizes new features as a sequence of work. You can have many commits before you actually go into the master branch. Uh, there, these branches are usually combined and merged into uh, the master branch. So you, but the development and um, testing go on in the branch before it's merged into master. And that's when the uh, integration of the code takes place. Here's an example of uh, a kind of a rather messy idea. And if you think about multiply this quite a bit, you could have uh, a complexity that you really don't 
uh, want that is confusing. So what you need are workflow policies. You can see here, uh, these branches weren't named for anything that you could tell what it is by just looking at them. Uh, what is stuff? Who knows? And and B may be defined somewhere else, but uh, um, they're not clearly defined right here, which would be is what you want. You want some policies that help you. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't, and you don't want things to become so complex that it's just hard to to use. Uh, only use complexity where you need it. Make sure you uh, have some policies about naming. Uh, link this to uh, your issue tracking system. If you're working on a new feature, make the name something that describes that feature. And then make some policies about where your branches start and end. It's usually not a, a good policy to have branches starting from another branch and then going into a different branch like this uh, example shows. So um, the feature branches extend your centralized workflow. You can see that here we have uh, an example where this is what's in the main repo. Bob pulled it at this commit B, these represent the commits, and Bob pulled his and started working on it issue 151. So now he's named this for a good name. Uh, Alice uh, is, is adding a solver and, and we just have this A here for because we don't have the name of it, but uh, we'll say this is a, a good name here. And uh, so she's working on that branch and they can work on these two things in parallel. So this is what the copy in Alice's repo and that's Bob's uh, local repo. So Alice uh, integrates first and now you can see that her repo looks like um, has now has one branch. She's gotten rid of her, her branch and then she pushes it to master and so those are identical. In the meantime, uh, Bob decides that uh, he should pull from the remote and he finds Alice's changes and he has a conflict here. Um, and he, this shows that um, you can work and then uh, pull the main repo back to yours. Um, but uh, Bob needs to uh, do something about this conflict. So what he does is he rebases and then these two um, different representations of his commits will be there. Uh, e prime is, and he'll have to do some type of, uh, he'll have, since he had a conflict, he'll have to do some type of fix for that. And he can now work, uh, Alice can actually work with him on his branch and then they can fix these so that they have a correct version that will uh, test properly and um, they can merge that into master. And that work, this is where the collaboration comes in play. You can um, do some communication offline and decide what um, is the best way to proceed is what is what are the proper fixes for that merge conflict. If you'd like to see a richer description of the feature branch, you can go to the, this uh, reference here. So there are other types of branches. Um, the, one of the main thing are the infinite lifetime branches, not just master, but you might have more than one, like in this example here, there's a development uh, branch that is also a lifetime branch. These are usually based off of master uh, they will exist in all these copies of the repository and uh, they provide different um, environments. You may have things like production for and pre-production lifetime branches. And you can see uh, the policies for this uh, particular, it looks like the policies here are that all work, are all the feature branches are based off of master, commits go into development first, and then at some point, um, the commits are then uh, pushed into uh, master. And uh, a lot of times testing will go on uh, in, before things are merged into either of these lifetime branches. <clears throat> so the next mechanism is pull request. This gives the uh, team a means of testing and reviewing uh, feature branches and issue branches before they are merged into the master branch. I also get, tells others that uh, you have changes that you want to go into the master branch. Um, you can have discussions over these commits and um, 
can even these discussions can even um, end up with extra commits that would go into the uh, branch before they are tested and reviewed and merged into the master. Uh, with a pull request, you can request a, a particular reviewer. If you know someone has an expertise in, in um, either the domain or maybe in the way you produce this code and you want them to really check it, uh, maybe you've uh, modified someone's, uh, you know that someone has made this code and you uh, modify it, you want them to look at it, make sure it didn't, um, they, that they agree with it. And then this is, you can set policies for the merge, uh, such as how many reviewers, how many approvals are needed and what the test criteria are. The last mechanism I'll go through are GitHub forks. Uh, a fork is a copy of the repository inside another GitHub account. And this is a means to be able to collaborate with people outside of your team uh, that don't have right access and that so they can fork your project and they can work there. Uh, they can also suggest uh, uh, do pull requests to suggest changes to the, the original repository. Uh, there's some things you have to think about. If you fork a public repository, the fork will also be public. Um, it gives you the advantage of you can give access of uh, right access to a fork to maybe someone that doesn't have uh, right access to the original repository. And uh, you can't fork a fork. And um, it doesn't copy any of the issues or the pull requests from the original uh, repository. Uh, you, can, uh, you need to use branches within the fork. Don't modify master that you can get into um, a problem with a divergence there. And uh, if you were gonna do a pull request, that's not gonna work well. <laughs> So these pull requests, um, you, with a pull request in a fork, you can um, suggest changes to the upstream repository and the managers of that team can decide whether or not that, go, that can go into the main and uh, original repository. So um, people working in a, a fork, those branches don't go into the upstream repository, so it keeps it clean. So the managers of that upstream repository don't have to worry about all the things that are going on in these and they have a pollution of many branches and in the original repository. So now what I want to do is go through some of the different models so that we can think about uh, how uh, to collaborate. These are some original and commonly known workflows and then we'll get into some examples with the scientific teams. So here's Gitflow. Um, it was de it's designed for software that has official releases and you can see it's, it looks kind of complex. They use Git extensions to enforce their policies um, and it has uh, different branches that are, uh, there's rules where they're based off. They have feature branches that are all based off this develop uh, lifetime branch, they have the main master branch uh, where you have, you can see they have the tags for releases and um, then they have release branches, which may be um, time. They know that they're going to try to have releases every quarter or whatever their schedule is. And then these feature branches, they work off develop and go back and develop before they go into the feature branches. And then those, at some point, there's a decision what goes into the actual master. Now, you can see a hot disk branch when there's something that's an error. And um, of course, that would be pushed in both the develop and into the uh, master branch. Um, this brings up some questions. How do you keep these, the develop and the master branch synchronized? And what do you do about merge conflicts? Uh, when they occur, how are they resolved? Where should they? be pushed into. Um, so, it, you know, we, you may not want to use something as complex as this, but this is um, a good design for uh, software that has official releases and a release schedule. So GitHub Flow was published as a viable alternate to GitFlow. It's a lot simpler workflow, but it depends on, um, it uses continuous deployment 
and continuous integration um, so that it doesn't have to have the same kind of complexity that uh, GitFlow did. Uh, there's no structured release schedule. And so all commits in master are deployable. The uh, base, all the feature branches are based off of master. And um, what they would like to see is that you push your local repository constantly, uh, open pull requests early so that you can have a dialogue. And um, these pull requests um, can be changed as, or people can uh, suggest other commits to them before they go into master. And of course, in almost all of these uh, work uh, get flows, get workflows, you would merge into a lifetime branch such as master after a pull request review and testing. Then um, GitLab flow was published as another alternative to the two previous workflows. It has a semi-structured release schedule and it, but it simplifies the difficulties in synchronizing the infinite lifetime branches. And what the main idea is that there's a ma the master branch is considered the staging area, and then the um, code flows into pre-production and production infinite lifetime branches. So this allows releases downstream. Uh, the fixes are made upstream, merged into master, and then um, cherry-picked into the release branches. And finally, I want to go through uh, some examples of some scientific teams that use Git workflows and what their workflow actually are. You'll see some similarities to the, the three workflow models that I just went through and to each other. And they have slight variations that work for their projects. You can look through the, as we're going through these, you might want to look back at them. I have references for them. And then you can decide what works well for your team or um, your project. This is the Trilinos uh, workflow. Trilinos is a project that has a community of developers. They focus on creating algorithms. Um, there's a collection of reusable scientific software libraries. They are known for their solvers. They have uh, multiple uh, types of solvers, linear, nonlinear transient, um, uncertain uh, quantification solvers, and optimization solvers. And um, they work with two lifetime branches, their master and develop branch. And all the features start and end with develop. So all the changes for develop come from GitHub pull requests, and they're tested, and then um, merged back into develop when they're finished. And at some point, they decide when that they will go into the master branch. Um, the change sets are from develop are tested daily so that they, they know that the integration in the master is seamless. Um, this workflow is designed so that all the commits in master are in develop and that none of the, uh, there are never any merge conflicts in uh, master. They all are resolved by the time they get into develop. Uh, OpenMPI is a uh, high-performance message passing library, and um, many of you will work with that if you're uh, doing distributed computation. And uh, most scientific teams are, are using this now because of the uh, architectures that are available. They have a uh, different type of version, versioning. They've, the major versions break compatibility, and uh, there are minor versions. Uh, but you can see uh, tags for those, uh, releases, correct issues. And you can see here that they have, um, they support two, um, life, two releases, the latest one and the previous one. And then um, there may be an upcoming release, so you'll have branches for each of those. Um, and then, of course, the master branch. And all, um, so this workflow supports the two most recent releases. Uh, all, all issues are addressed for each uh, branch that they're applicable to. And then all PRs, of course, again, are reviewed. They, and they have a policy that they have to be reviewed by at least one core developer. We have um, developers work on master. And their testing includes continuous integration testing, 
uh, which will be explained further on in the tutorial. On all PRs, um, for any branch, they use Jenkins with a limited set of compilers, hardware, and tests. And then they have nightly testing on all branches, which have a more complex set of compilers, hardware, and tests. And then um, they do some more additional comprehensive testing for the release candidates. And finally, um, the Flexi project has a, a different type of workflow, but you will see some similarities in this. Uh, Flexi is a compile time configurable framework designed to support multi-physics applications uh, development for both current and emerging HPC systems. You can see that they have, uh, they also use a major feature, um, and that's where they base their branches off of. The features are named for the major version control, and uh, once they change a major, that's where the, you can, I don't know if you can read this because it is a little small, but that's where they start a new branch, and you can see all of this goes into develop, and the they call this branch incompatible because when they change to a new major um, branch, it's not backwards compatible. Uh, you can see here it has three types of branches. The, the, uh, of course, we have developed, then we have this major branch, and then they have minor branches for um, different types of um, features. So um, you can see here that this is called the 1.x branch. Here's the 1.0 release branch. Uh, they tag it with a initially with a 1.0 for the initial release, and then as they're doing um, fixes or putting in minor uh, releases, they'll tag each one. And then they start over when they decide that uh, we have a new minor uh, release that we're going to work on. And you can see this is the they have a new branch and they tag it with appropriate starting with an initial of here, 1.1.0. Then when this gets to a feature that would break compatibility, they start a new uh, series of major branch over, um, and this whole process happens again. So those are the uh, three uh, scientific software teams and the way they use Git Workflow for um, collaboration. We, I want you to think about uh, the things that would work for you. First of all, you need to establish a clear set of policies uh, so that your code will be correct on a particular branch and uh, that ensures the, that your team can work in parallel and communicate well. Um, one thing I didn't mention here with Git is the issues. You can communicate through issues on Git uh, and that then you'll have a record of the communication that went on. Um, and this would al also minimize some of the difficulties. And you can, attack, you can um, through these issues, you can, your branches can um, look at them. Uh, they can be tagged with them. Um, you want to minimize the difficulties associated with uh, your parallel and distributed work. And the overheads and learning and following and enforcing these policies. So that's another thing you need to think about is documenting what the policies are so that you can um, onboard people to uh, they can learn them as they come up and they can follow them. Or anybody that is um, de developing uh, from outside the team can clearly see what your policies are before they try to uh, do a PR to your original um, GitHub repository. To think about what your team, uh, who's in your team, um, what the culture of your team is, what uh, challenges your project has, uh, what's feasible, um, and what's acceptable to your team members, uh, to your users. Uh, start simple, only add complexity when you need it. Um, just uh, get started, that's one of the main things, and think about a simple flow and then you can um, devise your policies around that. And that's all I have. And I'll stop uh, 